Uh, hello, good, good day, uh, attendees. Uh, my name is Larkin Liu. I am a mentor on Sharp as Minds. I've been a mentor since 2017, I believe. Yeah, it was Jeremy who called me in 2017, I think, yeah. So it's roughly been four years now. Um, Sharp as Minds, great platform for people to learn about data science uh, and, and, and jumpstart their careers in data science. And I've successfully mentored uh, three three mentees in the past. Uh, it's a great program, highly recommended for, well, if you guys are already in the program, but if anyone's not, or if you guys are watching this video, um, yeah, it's a great program. Um, but um, then uh, we thank Sharp Response for sponsoring our chat, um, our, our webinar on on this topic called uh, Extensible and Modular Design for uh, an Implementation of Monte Carlo Tree Search for the JVM. Um, my name, again, um, I am associated with the currently the Technical University of Munich, um, and John and June is, uh, is, uh, is associated with Carnegie Mellon University, um, and this is a uh, joint collaborative project um, that was worked out between the two of us to develop this software. Um, quick, quick biographies, I mean, I already talked about myself. Uh, I am a Chinese-Canadian research scientist. Uh, I did my undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Toronto. I've worked as a data scientist for six years now. Um, and uh, currently I'm a doctoral student at, at Technical University of Munich. Um, June, uh, do you want to talk about yourself or? Sure, yeah. So I'm June, uh, June Tao, uh, or a lot of friends call me John. Uh, I am a uh, Chinese Canadian software engineer. Uh, I did my undergrad in uh, Toronto, and uh, I've worked at uh, Microsoft for uh, several years, and now I am enrolled as a master's student at Carnegie Mellon and doing my uh, master's here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks, Molly. Got that out of the way. All right. So let's talk about our software, um, why we built what we did. So the title of the chat is uh, talk is a uh, sensible module design. An implementation of Monte Carlo tree search. That's the algorithm we're focused on today. Um, and I guess it might be a little bit deep to jump into the, the talk with them, talking about what Monte Carlo tree search actually is. I think it's part of the slide set. Um, so maybe we should start with that. Actually, yes, we should start. With, we should start with what is Monte Carlo tree search before we talk about the, the design principles for the software package. Um, Monte Carlo tree search is essentially mathematical perspective, um, you can think about it as a solution for markup decision processes. And um, I apologize, this is a, an advanced set of seminar, so it is expected that some people know some of the mathematics, but I'll try to recap it as quickly as possible. Um, and we'll focus on, I guess, discrete markup decision processes. Um, it is a, a, a formulation of a discrete process where an agent uh, in, a, in an environment. Um, this agent can take steps in an environment. Uh, they're called actions. You can take actions in an environment and each action will land the agent in a different state and the transition from state to state will yield a reward. So maybe if you're walking in a grid, you might step in a hole or you might find some gold. Um, these observations, uh, these states yield um, uh, true rewards in an MDP, what you see is actually what you get. You're never going to walk into a hole and don't realize it's a hole. Uh, it's 100% observable. And so this is the construct of a markup decision process. And in any markup decision process, usually, almost always, the goal is to find what's known as an optimal policy, where uh, we want to give um, a plan for the agent in any, any state in the world it's in, the, in the environment it's in, that there's an optimal action that they should take, the agent should take. So at any point in a, in a, in a, in a grid, for example, this is an example, there's an optimal action that they should take for an agent, usually a robot or something, or an agent in the game. Um, the math that you see in front of you, uh, it's basically saying that we want to optimize something known as a value of any state. The value is determined by the reward, denoted by R. 
reward uh, when you take an action, the immediate reward you get, plus when you land into the next state, the value of that state. So you see this is a recursive function. And usually these things can be solved by dynamic programming, um, but um, this is the more traditional solution. But usually these dynamic programming solutions are quite intractable. If the state space or the action space or both are too big, it can, it can be an extremely intractable problem. And we have to rely on some approximate solutions, some sub, some sub sampling of the state action space, such that we can get a near optimal solution. And the proof of whether or not these near optimal solutions are realities or how bounded they are is not the focus of this talk. The focus of this talk is to introduce a method called uh, Monte Carlo tree search that is that can be used to approximate um, the optimal policy. Uh, this is just more mathematics here. Um, Okay, um, the key challenge of the Markov distribution processes, I guess, the dimension, high dimensionality of state space. Sometimes um, it's not always a perfect condition. Sometimes you might define an MDP really elegantly mathematically, but it's a little bit imperfect. Um, and, 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 then, and, then, and then all the, all the nice mathematical formulas don't really hold very well. Um, and of course, uh, sometimes mathematics cannot be defined, cannot define the MDP if the MDP can, does not have a mathematical formula. So maybe it's a it's a game or it's an online game or it's a, or it's a experimental system that you can simulate, but we don't we can't be described mathematically maybe, and, and these are challenges where traditional methods such as dynamic programming are it's a hard hard to solve um, for for certain MDPs. And this is the motivation for um, again these are some methods uh, uh, that that you can use from traditional world to solve MDPs. Uh, it includes stochastic programming, approximate dynamic programming, as I mentioned earlier, mixed integer programming as well. Um, these are the different world of solutions. Um, they involve the precise mathematics, and a lot of times it, it's not very tractable. On the other the scale of things are the Monte Carlo methods, the pure Monte Carlo methods, which basically entails random plays of an agent through an environment, and then you get a reward in return. And then based on this subsample, we, we, we make a judgment on the, on, on the optimal action policy of the agent. Um, uh, this is, we talk, this slide talks about multi arm bandit strategy, um, which is very similar to, uh, to Monte Carlo tree search, but with the multi, so it's a good starting point because um, in multi arm bandit, we are simply, the state doesn't really change, but we simply want to discover the, um, the optimal a policy when the state is non is intransient. <clears throat> so in this case, the reward is defined as um, the probability you get some actual reward given an action you take under the, under some policy pi. And the regret in order to recursive R is under the optimal policy, the best plan that we have, and then the current um, the current policy uh, that we have. Uh, what is the difference? The difference, of course, the regret, the best possible action we can take, and minus the optimal policy or the op policy that we, de we designed. And, and, and to get this, obviously, um, for multi arm bandit, where the state doesn't change, if you just reveal the system, you would know, okay, maybe this, this play is always the best because the agent doesn't change steps. It's not like in a previous version where um, you can see there's a recursive component where it's the immediate reward plus the transition state and its value. In this one, it's mostly just the, the static value itself. So we're just talking about at a certain state. So why do we talk about this? Because Monte Carlo tree search is basically a multi arm bandit strategy, but now it's 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 for transient states, um, states that do change over time, um, with the actions that you take. I won't talk about this slide. It's just um, some theory for the multi arm bandit. Now this is the more important slide we want to talk about. So multi arm bandit. Uh, sorry, sorry. Multi color tree search, as I mentioned earlier, is an extension of the multi arm bandit problem or the, or the strategy where we're basically sampling from some, uh, some action space and then inferring which is the best policy based on the actions that we serve and the rewards that we gain. So, if we take a look at the, 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 the diagram ahead of us uh, on top here, um, multi color tree search is very uniquely um, divided in four key mechanisms. 
the selection, the expansion, the simulation, and the back propagation. And as you can see, the agent with each arrow indicating the action that it takes, it can transition from state to state, from state to state again, uh, therefore creating a tree, hence the name the tree in the tree search. Um, the selection just basically using some, uh, some usually some usually the gradient search um, finds the, uh, the state that it wants to go to that that's already been explored. Expansion proposes a candidate of the next action it should take to explore a new state. The simulation now um, simulates uh, using a, a certain cleverness. Uh, no, actually, it's purely random, but it could be clever depending on how it can connect. So this is where you know you can design algorithms. It simulates using random, random, random plays. You know uh, what what the estimate of the reward is going to be at this at this state. And the back propagation simply just like a neural network. It back propagates this reward value. Um, recursively back to the top. So, um, one of the key um, innovations of, uh, of multicultural research, borrowing from the multi embedded, is its use of the UCP one regret uh, strategy, where um, in the in the selection phase, in this selecting which uh, which uh, explored state to initiate initiate the expansion and simulation from. It is judged by the um, the expected uh, reward of the state. Sorry, uh, I think the expected reward of the state plus some adjustment factor that's denoted by a reward if you have uh, if you visited the state. Um, uh, if you a penalty if you visit this, this state too much um, is is the next state that is proposing. So this is the previous one and the next one by n or s prime. So if you explore the state that's n prime state too much, the candidate state too much, it will penalize this value uh, in proportion to how many times this, this the previous state was visited. So it is a balance between what the expected reward is that you get plus some adjustment factor penalizing for when you visited it more. And this is actually uh, uh, based on UCP1 red brown and multi arm bandit. If you're more curious about reading up this, you can. There's this very theoretically sound. Um, this is why it's the same formulation is being used for multicolored research. And so um, these type of algorithms have been shown to be effective at approximating MDPs, whether it's a single agent or multi-agent uh, system um, where opponents play against each other. These type of uh, algorithms have been shown to be very effective. Uh, in providing uh, state-of-the-art solutions. Um, some key advantages, uh, of, uh, see, key advantages of MCTS, as I mentioned they, they, earlier, they do not require model parameters. So um, if you don't know, like if you just have a game that you created, you don't know, you can't mathematically describe it, no worries, just have a program that will produce, reproduce the results and you can run these type of algorithms on it. Um, it does not scale to the state action space. You can have as many states as you want or actions as you want. It is more limited by the mechanics of your search uh, as opposed to the reality of the state space. You could have millions of states that are hardly ever visited. It will not have to take those into account if they rarely ever get sampled. Um, and uh, the expected reward can be flexibly determined and you know, you can add heuristics to adjust to adjust how you determine the expected rewards in each state, um, or, or the future states that is uh, as prime. But some of the challenges of MCTS, not a, of MCTS, not a perfect world. Um, one of the issues is that a lot of times will fall into local maxima minima. So, for example, look at the look at the diagram here. Sometimes you know it could get greedy and it could just get trapped. It could get trapped in, in certain certain selections. And fail to explore the rest of the things. Um, it, it, there's no guarantee that it will actually converge to the most optimal value. It's not very mathematically sound in that respect. And there's a lot of guesswork involved in determining, for example, heuristics to, that we would alter, which we'll talk about later. And so now we briefly covered the, the, the theory of multi-college the research. And I think I did a very poor job of this, but. Uh, <laughs> But if you have any questions, 
you can ask me or read the literature. Uh, I want to not talk about the software side of things. Uh, the software side is um, when we before we even build a software library for anything. What are what are the key um, design aspects that we want to take into account? Right. So now we're in the world of software engineering, not mathematical theory. Um, so the background that we have is here is this right. Um, in the past, in the open source world, uh, there is a lack of, of general um, MCTS implementations. Um, there are individual packages that are built. They're not the most reliable thing in the world. And it's not a very generalized thing. We aim to have this general package we want to, to build for everyone. And anyone can just import it, use it on JVM. And then the next point is JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Um, there, there, there isn't that many, even machine learning. JVM, need, needless to say, MCTS implementations. And, and, and research reproducibility and deployment. So we aim to develop something that's very easy to reproduce. So you import something and you can run it, you get the same results. And it's also very applicable to a lot of research problems. And, and so that's that's some of the things that we, want, we kind of wanted to aim for. Um, and so we ended up picking you know, the JVM, but also Kotlin as our language within the JVM. So why, why did you use JVM, people might ask. Um, well, uh, JVM is very popular, is one, one answer. It's, it's a very popular language uh, or framework. Um, it has a very strong knowledge base, uh, very good support, and backwards compatible, and it has a lot of legacy support as well. So just due to popularity is one argument. Um, JVM is heavily used on a lot of applications, especially like mobile applications for Android, and like all the web applications. Um, and we decided that we're going to develop through JVM. We also want to use a more modern programming language, so we picked Kotlin, which is very succinct and concise. Uh, it has powerful primitives, and it supports a wide range of programming paradigms. I'm not reading off the slide right here, but uh, <laughs> but yes, it's it's a beautiful language. Um, it's a lot better than Java in in the way you can express stuff, and the code is not readable, and it's got a lot of syntax sure that we use. So. Next step, um, you know, we want to talk about the key design. So when we're building this software library, what do we actually have in mind? How are we grading our software? Because it's good or bad. Well, first thing, we should make it extensive. Right? So if anyone was to use this library, it should be, um, it should have a lot of common components. They should obey object-oriented programming. If you need to use one component, you can inherit it out. You shouldn't have to rewrite anything. Um, it should be very easy to do. And this is one key design principle. That is modularity. As I mentioned earlier, you know, with MCTS, it can actually be designed in many different ways. Although the people look at the diagram here, you know, selection can doesn't have to be driven by this UCT selection strategy. It could be driven by a strategy of your own. Expansion can be defined in a different way. The expansion and simulation steps could be reversed. They don't have to follow this order. They could, these two steps could actually be reversed. And you can also change the way you back propagate stuff. And then as a whole, we can also add heuristics. So these are all innovations you can do to MCTS. And we want to make these innovations uh, very easy to do. So um, that's the modularity concept. And then lastly, it's just standardization. And ease of, so if you just import the package in a standard way, you can use it in a standard way. There is no dependency result, resolution issues or compatibilities in the issues. Backwards compatible, nothing to do with Java 8. Which is a standard, which is a very standard version. So we had all these, all these design principles in mind when we built this code. Uh, and you talk about the mathematical theory. So June, do you want to talk about the software implementation, or do you want me to? Do you want me to do this? Yeah, sure. I can uh, take over and uh, um, cool. talk about the software implementation. Uh, I will uh, share my screen. And uh, can you see uh, my slides? Can you see uh, well, Martin? You can see it? Hello? Yep, can see. Oh, okay. Um, yes, yeah, just wanted to get a confirmation. Uh, sounds good. Uh, so yeah, um, essentially, uh, thank you, Larkin, for uh, laying the groundwork for understanding uh, what we're trying to do and uh, the goals that we had in mind. 
and now I'll talk about the specifics and the nitty gritty details on how it's actually implemented in software. So uh, the core of our MC tree, uh, tree search for J library uh, is the uh, what's shown on the diagram here. This is what we provide uh, in box. And uh, from what you can see here, the, the two main abstractions that we provide, uh, which are the boxes in green, uh, is the MDP uh, initial uh, representation of your problem and the solver abstraction that uh, defines how solvers should operate to solve uh, a given MDP. So for a MDP, it has all the necessary components and APIs to define how a uh, MDP model um, should be represented. Uh, these uh, are the things that um, Larkin has mentioned before uh, in terms of uh, providing an initial state, determining whether a state is a given state is terminal, uh, what actions can be taken from any one particular state, uh, how to transition from a state given in an action, and the, ro uh, the ro uh, reward function that is used to calculate how good that action is. Uh, this is uh, purely an abstraction uh, in the library, and the users are expected to implement uh, this MDP definition, uh, since this is not something that can be generically applied to uh, all MDPs out there. You have to define how these behaviors uh, work for your particular problem. Uh, on the solver side, we have something similar. Uh, we require that all solvers have to have the uh, select, expand, simulate, and prop, uh, back propagate steps. They need to uh, essentially, uh, if you were to write a solver, you would need to implement those four, st uh, four steps. However, we also provide some default implementations. So this is like the default order of running uh, these four steps in specifically that sequence, select, expand, simulate, and prop, uh, propagate. And we also provide some built-in tools such as uh, extracting the optimal op action after you're done uh, running your tree search and uh, also calculating your UCT uh, using the uh, formula that uh, Larkin uh, showed before. Uh, and beyond just the solver, uh, itself, we also provide two uh, additional implementation um, on top of it to give uh, very uh, common um, uses uh, or implementations for uh, implementing these solvers. So uh, essentially during selection, uh, the most common strategy we see is you evaluate UCT and pick based on the best UCT value. So we have provided an, an implementation for that so you don't have to um, do that yourself and you can use these uh, one of these two solvers directly out of the box uh, for expansion uh, the default implementation just takes one of the possible nodes and uh, randomly and chooses it uh, simulate is taking a sequence of random steps until either it hits a terminal state or it hits a uh, essentially simulation depth limit uh, and then back propagate we just uh, essentially bring back uh, or propagate the rewards back up the uh, tree all the way to the node. So these are the default implementations that we have in generic solver. There's a little bit of a flavor difference between a generic solver and a stateful solver in that stateful solvers actually keep track of the state at each node inside the uh, tree. Whereas the generic solver doesn't, it just, it doesn't know which uh, anything about the state and it reruns the simulation from the initial state down to wherever you are uh, for every iteration of the uh, tree search. So those are a little bit of the uh, overall picture of what they're doing. So let's take a little bit uh, of um, a closer look at what a MDP is specifically. So on the MDP abstraction itself, again, we see uh, these five um, functions that needs to be implemented to actually represent what the how the MDP behaves. So in the transition function, uh, you will be given a state type that is the, that represents the current uh, state, uh, an action that is to be taken, and it will return a new state, uh, essentially what uh, the transition will uh, go to. Uh, similarly, for rewards, you're given essentially the state uh, that the previous state, the action that was taken, uh, the current state, and then you return a double. 
Uh, similar things for initial is terminal and actions. I'm not going to go over um, all of them since um, we have, uh, we, or we will have uh, more comments explaining exactly how they work. And they're a little bit more uh, uh, of uh, two uh, fine grained details that can be um, kind of elaborated on as you use the library. So how do you use these libraries? Uh, for users uh, in, in their user code, uh, what you absolutely need to do is implement uh, a uh, MDP. So provide a definition for all the MDP uh, functions that you should have seen on the previous slide. And then you have to make another call on how you solve that MDP. Uh, the solvers that we provide in box, so that is the um, generic solver and the stateful solver will work on any MDPs that you have defined. They will work out, uh, out of the box. Uh, you, ha you have to obviously specify some parameters like the maximum depth th uh, that simulations can run for, uh, but otherwise they will work. However, um, they might not work very well uh, because uh, given a specific MDP, there are optimizations that you can do specifically uh, for that type of problem. Um, and, and I'll show a working example of that. Uh, but to facilitate that, all of the reverse C solver or all of the solver functions are overridable. So you can provide your own implementations to uh, essentially optimize for your specific scenario. Um, so uh, in the example here uh, for the reverse C solver, we decided that uh, the simulate function could do uh, with a bit of a better um, I guess, uh, implementation rather than just taking random steps. Uh, taking a lot of random uh, actions in a game of reverse e is, is not a great strategy. You're, you're very rarely going to uh, do well playing random moves for actually just any board game in general. Um, but let's take a look at what a solver looks like. So uh, the solver that uh, we have provided, uh, the abstraction here, uh, you it requires that you provide the implementations for uh, select, expand, simulate, and backpropagate, as you can see in these abstract functions. Uh, we do that in the um, generic solver and the um, stateful solver, but you can also override those. Uh, and then we provide, uh, again, default uh, implementations for run tree search, which uh, essentially runs these steps, uh, select to backpropagate in a loop uh, up to a certain uh, up to an amount that you specify uh, via the iteration count, essentially. And uh, yeah, with all of that, those details, I think it's uh, we're ready to take a look at uh, what we how to actually use it and uh, what it looks like when you um, actually use this in production. So here we have uh, essentially a, a game uh, called Reversi or Othello for um, in case that is what you're more familiar with. Um, unfortunately, I, uh, we had a little bit of an environment issue, so I can't exactly um, go uh, and show the uh, UI component of this, but uh, we'll have to con Maybe that be content. actually explain what Reversi is, like how the rules of the game work. I wonder if we can yeah, find a Reversi. So, uh, well, no, not shopping, uh, probably images is probably a little bit more uh, intuitive. Uh, actually, you know what, let's just go to the Wikipedia article maybe. Yeah, okay, so uh, the game itself looks something like this and you play as either white or black. And um, when you uh, start the game, this is the initial board. So this is essentially the initial state of the MDP. And uh, what you want to do is place one of your pieces so that it captures uh, an opponent piece. Uh, and to capture it, you need to have um, your own token on uh, either side of it. So for example, if you were to go uh, 6E right here, that's a valid move for black because it will capture the piece at E5 because it also has a black piece on E4 and E4 and E6 uh, essentially flank the white piece, the opponent piece, uh, E5. So, so this is just a very um, brief um, introduction to what this game actually does. And then you can, uh, again, like continue black and white will uh, keep on playing until 
either there are no more uh, possible moves that can be made or uh, essentially all moves have been taken. And uh, the uh, final outcome is whoever have the most tokens or pieces on the board uh, wins the game. So that's a bit of uh, background on reversing. So uh, in code, uh, what does that look like? Well, um, we can um, assume that uh, reversing controller, uh, we have either a library or you uh, write the representation of that game uh, yourself. Uh, and that is uh, essentially represented here by the reversing controller. So it, this gets, uh, allows you to essentially execute a move, um, get feasible moves and, and things like that. But uh, it, you know, this is either something you write or you use a library to actually represent your own uh, scenario, but it hasn't used our library yet. And how you make use of uh, that in our library is, uh, if we take a look at uh, reverse MDP. Oh, by the way, I, I hope that uh, I'm zoomed in enough so everyone can actually see the code. Yep, it's readable. Okay, perfect. So um, essentially, if we want to um, represent reversi uh, as an MDP, uh, this is what we would need to do. Uh, we write our own uh, reversi MDP class and we inherit uh, or extend uh, the MDP uh, representation. We also specify essentially the states that we're working with and um, uh, the actions that it can take. Uh, here, it's a point because it's just uh, exactly which essentially board location that you're actually going to place your, um, your token at. So uh, again, for uh, actions, we just go to our uh, implementation of reversi and ask, hey, if I'm in a current state, uh, what actual moves can I make? Uh, initial state is just, well, the, the starting board position that uh, um, I showed previously. Uh, is terminal, uh, again, this is uh, going to depend on the implementation here, but uh, we just, we always, uh, as part of our state, uh, keep track of who the current player is. And uh, if no one is a current player, uh, then we will know that the game has ended. And the roar function, we take a look at the board state, calculate uh, the overall token count, and uh, we decide uh, who wins um, and what the score is. And uh, for this, it is since we only represent a score as a double, uh, we uh, can potentially have negative rewards. Uh, so that biases towards one of the players and uh, positive scores means uh, good for you. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we have the transitions. Uh, so as you can see, using our library is pretty simple. Uh, you only have to uh, define these functions. And for most of these uh, functions, uh, in a majority of the scenarios, it's going to be uh, very easy uh, to uh, essentially write what actually, uh, how, how those functions should behave. So you know, getting actions should be, uh, in this case, it's just one line, given that we have a library to represent how reversing works. Um, and now we take a look at essentially how we, so we have a MDP representation of the reversing board game. Great. So what does a solver look like? Well, our solver looks, uh, if we want a very simple one, that's all. In fact, you don't really need uh, get move either, uh, because get move is essentially uh, picking uh, a specific uh, action to take uh, after running simulation for a while. So th this is more of a convenience um, that uh, can, uh, this is a convenience function that we use uh, for our uh, little game here. Uh, but otherwise, what you need to do is uh, you uh, define a reverse solver uh, and then uh, you extend one of the solvers that we have uh, implemented. So in this case, I chose a stateful solver since I want to save the game states, uh, but you can do this with generic solver as well. Uh, and this will work perfectly fine. In fact, I'll just make that change to essentially demonstrate that uh, this whole entire uh, game will also still work. Uh, and then we give it a little bit more of the um, uh, additional factors like simulation depth limits, uh, exploration count, reward discount factor. So these are uh, things that are used uh, as part of the uh, back propagation and uh, the uh, calculation of the UCT value. So uh, essentially these are hyperparameters that you'll just have to provide to the solver. And uh, with that, we already have a solver. 
uh, and again, uh, the get move is just a convenience factor. And what we can uh, see how uh, how we will use this is let's see, reverse main. Uh, we have these uh, reverse players um, that uh, will take a um, implementation of the uh, uh, solver that you use and. Uh, as a demo, uh, I'm going to have these uh, players that use these versus solvers to play against each other, and we'll see uh, what they do here. So I'm going to get the base reverse solvers to play against each other as uh, player one and player two, and I'm just going to run this and see what we get to. Uh, let's give it a moment. Oh, simulate root overrides nothing. Ah, okay. Let me go to the reverse solver and go back to the safe solver. There's a bit of a um, differences uh, with how the states are represented. So I'll just go back to the state for solver for now. Uh, so again, uh, over here, uh, we are uh, having player one and player two uh, playing against each other. So player one is our dark pieces and the player two are the light pieces. And as we can see, they're pretty even. Like they're obviously they're the same solver um, uh, implementation. So we kind of expect that. And just to uh, make sure that we're not biasing towards any one of the players, uh, we'll have uh, player two go first uh, for a second round of tests. Uh, this is because for reversi specifically, it's not proven that uh, it is beneficial to be either the first player or the second player. Um, so we're gonna uh, be very objective here and, and allow them to uh, play against each other, uh, both as a first and a second player. So overall, uh, we see that player one has won uh, seven times, player two has won nine times uh, out of 16. So very even. And we want to uh, potentially, even though like right now uh, it, it already works, unfortunately I cannot show you the uh, UI for this <laughs> to demonstrate that it's actually working. So uh, you also have to take my word for it. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll have that uh, essentially fixed up on the uh, GitHub repository. So you will be able to uh, run these uh, yourselves. This was a process that was not working like three hours ago. So I, I switched my laptop and I don't have the latest version of Java, so I can't run the GUI library. And then uh, June uh, try to do try to make the jar a bit better by creating a lot of jar. Yeah, I, I tried. Yeah, I tried to build a. <laughs> anyway. So, we'll so, we'll so skip that, those details. Uh, actually, you can see it, you know, be pretty competitive with a human that's not available for sure. So, so the, the lesson here uh, that we should, uh, I, I guess, repeat is that uh, don't change your demo like 30, uh, you know, 90 minutes before the actual, <laughs> before the actual presentation, since uh, things can go wrong in ways that you don't anticipate. However, anyway, uh, that sidetrack, uh, you know, uh, uh, done is that uh, we still do have the uh, command line kind of representation of what's actually uh, going on. And uh, we, we are uh, running these, um, essentially our actual solver. And we know that the results are random because, you know, uh, different players will win and they will win by different uh, margins. So uh, this is not, you know, uh, pre-specified uh, games that just play out where we're actually simulating these. So uh, my next point was, how would you improve on these solvers? Because uh, we mentioned that uh, we wanted to design for extensibility. You should be able to uh, change the behavior of any of these um, uh, pieces. And also it should be simple so that you can choose the one small piece that you want to override and use the default for everything else. Uh, and we also kind of uh, hinted that, oh, uh, you know, for specific MDP problems, there might be uh, more optimal solutions uh, that is only applicable uh, based on given you know the, the actual scenario context and uh, those things are all true for reversing so uh, let me just go back to my slides a little bit uh, and go into full screen mode uh, if it will cooperate hello nope. hmm So I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, and let's go to percent and uh, go into the software. 
application building site. This is the reverse heuristic that is uh, very often applied. So uh, in the game of reverse, uh, what we'll uh, see very often is that uh, these border uh, positions are very good. In fact, the best position are the corners because once you capture it, uh, your token cannot be captured after it. Uh, so these are uh, rated as very good, um, essentially, uh, positions if you can get into them. And it, uh, this heuristic represents that as a very high positive value. So uh, given that it's an adversarial game, we know that if we place a token beside those very awesome um, locations, then it gives the opportunity for a uh, adversary to capture the best position. So uh, we generally uh, rank those uh, actions as very poor. So we give them negative value. So th this is uh, a um, heuristic that is just uh, uh, kind of common in literature and uh, uh, it, it is very specific to uh, the reverse domain. It's not applicable in general, uh, but we can use it. We can use this. And how we would, would use it is we write a different, um, uh, implement a different reverse solver. So again, this, uh, this reverse solver with a human heuristics driven simulation extends the reverse solver that we have just seen um, and adds a little bit extra. So we have this uh, heuristic weight that uh, was, uh, I essentially just showed, uh, and we capture it in code. And when we run the simulation phase to essentially simulate what a game would play out as, instead of assuming that both uh, the opponent and the player will just take random moves, let's assume that everyone is a bit smarter than that and they want to make the best move possible for themselves. So th this more closely resembles what an actual uh, game uh, would feel like. Uh, all those are just, of course, there's still a little bit of randomness to it. So uh, we essentially, here it's very simple. We just take this uh, heuristic. Uh, we ask, well, uh, first thing to do is check whether you're in a uh, complete state, whether the game has ended. If we do, uh, compute the rewards and, and return. Uh, if not, then uh, we run the simulation loop uh, where we gather all the possible actions. Um, again, this is defined by the MDP. Uh, and then we uh, look at all of these valid actions and find the one that gives the best score based on the heuristic um, uh, criteria that I just uh, showed above. And we pick the best one and we, or there could be uh, several moves that have the same value, in which case we pick a random one. Um, and we take that action essentially uh, by calling the transition function on the MDP. So we stay, uh, we start with our current state, we take the action that we have selected, which is not completely random, it's like the random among the best that we have seen, uh, and we transition to a new state. And um, we, uh, yeah, we repeat this process until simulation is complete. Oh. Oh, 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 I think my uh, computer froze there for a second. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I was mentioning, so we run this um, simulation uh, again, uh, up to, until the simulation depth is reached or until a terminal uh, step is uh, reached. And that is the only thing, uh, only difference that we have changed here is uh, during the simulation step of the uh, MCTS, we decided to make it a little bit more um, intelligent, so to speak. And let's see uh, what how that actually um, uh, manifests itself in actual uh, scenarios. So let me see what is, what is going on here. Oh, I know. Um, Kotlin is trying to be very smart and removing imports that I don't actually use. Um, but I can just add the input back in. And we will see what happens with the heuristic sim versus a player we have seen before. And uh, as you can see, oh, hold on. A heuristic player uh, generally wins uh, on aggregate a lot more often than um, the uh, norm, uh, just a uh, random player. Uh, 
And uh, in, in this case, it won, oh, 10 to uh, six. Usually it's a little bit more uh, different, but uh, uh, you know, uh, with randomness, you can always get different types of results. If I run it again, uh, I bet I'll get something a little bit different. And uh, another thing that we can kind of observe um, with uh, Curis uh, or with Reversi is that uh, generally the second player has a little bit of advantage um, going second. Uh, this is kind of what people have been suspecting, but uh, again, this has not been proven yet. And we're seeing that uh, here as well. So when heuristic uh, player goes second, they uh, tend to do a little bit better. Uh, and I, ah, I know uh, what, uh, change, which is uh, for the reverse solver, we're running about um, uh, 400, uh, 200 iterations of uh, simulations uh, for this demo since we wanted it to run uh, quickly. But if you, uh, it, it doesn't really um, allow for very accurate uh, simulations. So uh, if we increase the simulation count, we realize, oh, that the heuristic player can actually use their heuristics kind of. Um, uh, driven simulation to, to their advantage. And yeah, this is more in line with uh, what I'm uh, expecting, which is the heuristic player should win, you know, seven to one usually. Yeah, and three to five. So um, yeah, as you can see, like obviously these, uh, all of these uh, hyperparameters are gonna change your results, but uh, what we can see here is mostly that uh, using a heuristics um, that is, uh, applicable to your domain, using that domain knowledge to your uh, benefit and uh, modifying the uh, solvers uh, can give you a much better result and a much better uh, solution um, using MCPS. And uh, hopefully I've uh, demonstrated that it is uh, using our library that is uh, quite simple to do. Uh, and uh, it can be applied to um, various uh, essentially scenarios. In this case, we use Reversi. Um, but um, we have also tried this on various other games, single player games, uh, probabilistic games like 2048, uh, single player, uh, or like other adversarial games like Net4, uh, single player games like, uh, what was that other game? Well, ah, it's escaping me for the moment. Uh, actually, you can take a look. 24 Push Your Luck, Grid World. Yeah, so, so we have uh, applied it to several games already and uh, yeah, we have seen that uh, this, even the generic solver that we provide in box gives you a reasonable uh, solution for those uh, MDP problems. And uh, I think that is all I had. Uh, Larkin, do you want to go into a little bit more of the results? Yeah, I'll wrap it up with uh, one more example um, and then uh, Sure. <laughs> My screen. You guys see my screen? Yep, I can see it. All right. So June talked about the um, the, the the fascinating uh, game of diversity and how uh, the software package can be used to to um, to create competitive solutions for adversity. And uh, the sad part is I think it actually see that the, the, the vanilla, the original Monte Carlo tree server is already relatively competitive for a novice reversity player, right? So, and we saw a clear improvement when the, when the when heuristic was added to the game. So that really shows, I guess one of the highlights that shows the modularity of the package you can actually modify it simply just with an idea, you need not Code it up from scratch. You just have an idea to alter a specific mechanism of MCTS, and you can improve its um, its, uh, its, uh, its 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 optimal policy or its policy, not optimal, but its policy. Could there potentially be a, a perfect game of reversi? Never make any mistakes. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a solved game. It's not a solved game, right? Like the thing, John. Right? Who else would you know? Um, anyways. So 
Another game that we benchmarked on was something called Grid Wolf. This is a probabilistic single player game. Um, it doesn't use any heuristics. Um, it's just a demonstrate. So the, the game is illustrated like this. Um, you have an agent in a diamond. It's moving on a grid. Each grid is a state. That's, the, the whole world is observable. So you know what you see is what you get. And we have the two uh, states where you can get a negative reward and one where you can get a plus five. Um, and so this is a very simple example. Um, the agent works like this. If you move to the left, you might not move to the left. You move to the left 80% of the time. And 20% of the time, you can move equally to anything else that is adjacent. So that's how good work works. As you can see, you're likely to move in a certain direction if you choose to take that action, but you're not guaranteed to go there. And so each state would have a, <laughs> sorry, a value associated with it. And this is a very easy example to see that for this probabilistic agent, the two best actions to take is down and left, right? And the bad actions are up and right. So if the MCTS solver is working properly, it should always solve for um, uh, left and down, right? And so here's what we do see. We're looking at the metrics of the MCTS as the iterations increase we see that the exploration term for the left and the down is going down. So um, actions are going down. So this means that it's <clears throat> that it's not it's 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 not wanting to explore that anymore because it knows it's the better it's the better option. Furthermore, um, the rewards that we get for left and down are higher or systematically higher uh, than for this optimal actions right and up <clears throat> as you can see here clear differences and therefore the, the number of visits in the, in the tree search should be greatly higher for um for the optimal actions the uh, the, 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 the left and the down have much more visits than the number of uh, in the number of visits for uh, the, this optimal. So these three plots show that the MCTS for a very basic example, probabilistic example, is presenting results that we expect to receive. So we know that this is a, a, a competent solver in, in, in some stochastic situations. And that really wraps it up. So, so John has, or June has demonstrated that, you know, um, the solver is modular, extensible, and can be proved very easily. I demonstrated that you know it's 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 a, it's a solver that works for for straightforward MTPs, and we set the landing zone or, or the first step to you, you can use this package to essentially build more stuff, and build new MCTS algorithms, or redefine heuristics, and, and change the way the mechanisms are, are, are run, um, and to in order to improve the, the, the MCTS, and hopefully. You know, we can also see that this is a very Java, a Java backwards compatible package. It can be used back to, back up to Java eight. Um, it is big. It's it's all all the benchmarks you see are ran on my local MacBook. Um, so it's a very lightweight application. It can in principle be ran on your mobile application on a mobile app for gaming. So it has a dual purpose of setting the the landing zone for doing further research into MCTS, but also being easily importable into uh, uh, low compute power devices um, very, very, very seamlessly. Um, and just want to iterate, you know, the key design was modularity and extensibility. You can, for research purposes, you can change and redesign the algorithm with ease without having to rebuild it from scratch, or you can reuse components. It's lightweight, as I mentioned earlier, very easy to deploy onto um, you know, low compute devices. And it's, it's setting the landing zone for future research because of its modularity and extensibility. And that's what our mission statement for building MC Tree Search 4J. Um, and of course, now it brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll leave the floor to questions if anyone has any. Don't think we have any other participants, so I doubt oh, there will be questions. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Happy to chat. Thanks, folks. Um, I'm actually going to uh, stop the recording. Great.